Okay. Hi everyone, let me thank you for all being here and welcome to the today's course online seminar. As always, I will talk about the first little bit. Force is dedicated to provide free outreach, high quality events and online seminars to reach broader robotics and the control engineering communities around the world. Thus, we periodically invite distinguished people like Dr. K. Spear to give their talks on recent recent research results related to robotics and control engineering. The aim of the force connecting academicians and government industry researchers with each other through the online research events here. So we cordially hope that you will enjoy this first event and this is the last one for the spring semester. Hopefully we will meet with you in the fall. And by taking this opportunity, I also would like to talk about the IEEE Control System Society, where you can also find the past four talks and many other talks at the IEEE CSS Video Library webpage. So let me also mention about the WebEx. You are all muted during the presentation. If not, please mute yourself. And if you want to ask questions after the presentation, you can do it simply by unmuting yourself or just uh, typing to the chat box and since this session is going to be recorded and to be posted to YouTube uh, to police CSS and force websites if you don't want to your voice to be in included in the video you can just ask your questions throughout the chat well jointly with Tansel and Sulem, we are very proud today to host Dr. David Caspi and David Crespi is the team lead over cooperative and intelligent UAV control with Control Science Center of Excellence, Aerospace System Directorate, Air Force Research Laboratory. In this capacity, he conducts and leads basic research in cooperative control and decision making of autonomous UAVs with a particular emphasis on high level decision making and planning under uncertainty. He received BS and PhD degrees in WE department from Brian Young University in 2003 and 2009, respectively. He is a former chair AIAA Intelligence Systems Technical Committee. He currently serves as a senior editor for Journal of Intelligent and Robotic Systems and as an associate editor for AIAA Journal of Aerospace Information Systems. Well, for all of you here, I would like to thank David for participating in our forum as a speaker. David, as you have the presentation ball, please go ahead and start whenever you are ready. All right. So I thank everybody for uh, listening to me and putting up with me ahead of time. So I've been at A4L for 12, 12 years now, um, and it's been a fun, fun opportunity to work with lots of different people. So today I'm going to talk about how control and optimization fit in as a foundation for multi UAV coordination. Okay, so just briefly overview. I work at AFRL in the Control Science Center of Excellence. It's a it's designated by AFOSR as a center of excellence in controls, and there's a number of teams and projects being worked in our group. But if you want to highlight kind of or emphasize what we do. Our group in AFRL, it takes problems that warfighters have or that uh, other programs within in the Air Force have in controls, and then we'll boil them down to kind of the fundamental um, uh, problems that they have with those and try to look for solutions using control theory and optimization. And so there's things we, that have been worked in the past or currently being worked on hypersonic air vehicles, flapping wing, thermal management for aircraft, precision airdrop, verification of autonomy, and like uh, cooperative control. And so our team uh, is the cooperative control team within there. And our focus is on developing theory for multi-agent decision-making in dynamic and uncertain environments. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about cooperative mission planning with static and dynamic tasks, uh, cooperative routing and trajectory planning. We'll go into a little bit on uh, differential games and optimal control. I won't talk about network control, but we do work on that. And we do, I, I do want to emphasize on, on top of writing papers and working on the theory, we also uh, flight test what we have to kind of as a proof of concept that mature those things. Um, 
So the team that we have here, I want to I, I want to say all this work is not me. It's it's a team effort. And along with ex a number of external cat collaborators, and I'll I'll, tr I'll I try to reference all the people that, that we work with in here. But um, this is a lot. This is thanks to these guys for all they do um, on the team. So, an overview of this talk. I am going to be stating my opinions about things. You can agree with them or not. I've tried really hard not to put equations in that. That might come at. The, so it's not a tutorial and it might kind of cause some things not to be clear, but you can always go to papers that we have to understand those. Because of this, some half of you might think I'm insulting your intelligence, but I hope that I can emphasize like uh, some Air Force relevant problems and the gaps in that we need to meet those problems. And well as start from basic approaches to show why we approach things the way we do and maybe hopefully come, come up with a different viewpoint or a different way of looking at problems. So where we sit um, for our team. So if you think about a UAV, uh, that's what down, down here, it's controlled by a number of actuators. They all have an autopilot that's, control, that's controlling the aircraft. We don't sit in this level, we're above that. So we're, we're passing commands to the autopilot, interfacing with the autopilot, that could be waypoints, it could be heading or speed commands, or it could be a little more inner loop like uh, thrust vector, roll rates, pit rate, things like that. But we're really not even working here. That's why this is a dotted line. It's really heading commands, speed commands, and waypoints. And what can we do with that? And so what, where we look at is the interface between the operator. How can we get information from the, the human operators and pilots and take that into a cooperative mission planner context and develop the, the ways to execute those tasks, plan paths within this mission planner, and then follow those uh, those plans and trajectories that are generated. So that, that's where we set up at this kind of mission planning to access execution level. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about today is cooperative routing and task allocation. So this, what I wanna say here is if you think about UAVs in like a, a military context, we have, tasks that need to be done. That could be, I need to fly over here and uh, look at a target. I need to follow a road um, and point my sensor along the road as I'm following it. Yeah, out in the civilian domain, it could be as simple as taking a person in, uh, in these new uh, urban air mobility things from one place to another as a task, or it could be delivering packages. But the point is there's these tasks that we can do and we, can, we, we know how to, automatically uh, do those tasks. Um, so what I'm talking about here for task allocation is we're trying to do a higher level decision-making of assigning those tasks to things. And what I'm gonna start with here is static tasks that are not moving. And so in the simplest case, we're trying to kind of build this with some graphical depictions. We have a number of tasks, here they're all the same, and we wanna assign them to agents that will service them. We might need to assign them based on the current task, these one, the current task load that each one of this, the servicing agents has, or the amount of time that it would take to do them. We want to distribute them to those agents according to these kind of metrics. Now, if the tasks are different and each of the servicing agents has different capabilities, then we, we're going to need to assign those a little differently. And now we're going to have to deal with the combinatorics of how we assign the best combinations of tasks to the appropriate agents. Now, the next step up from that is actually if those agents have to travel. So there's travel time associated with it, as well as possibly service time. These complicate this, these task assignment algorithms. They're not just simple combinatorial problems, but you have, you, know, you have to deal with this travel time. And I put down there kind of bold, the multi dispo TSP. A traveling salesman problem is when an agent has to go visit a number of different cities or nodes and come back to where it's at. Um, and so the, a multi disposer where you have multiple servicing agents that would travel around and come back. Okay, so it, it becomes more complicated <clears throat> and I'm kind of skipping over what makes it complicated. <clears throat> but, but here, let's, let's step back here for one second. With the standard TSP, you have one agent or a salesman that needs to go visit cities. 
and the, le the travel time or the distance that, that salesman is traveling is governed by the roads or the path that it's gonna take. It, it's a fixed travel time. And we just need to pick the route or the sequence of those, um, those cities that it needs to visit. That's fine if the roads are fixed or you can fly in straight, or if you can fly in straight lines. So like multi-rotors that can stop, they can turn and fly in a straight line. Those, those, uh, this kind of model is appropriate. But however, if you have fixed wing aircraft that, um, that have turn constraints, those things start to break down. So suppose you have a limited heading rate and you wanna get from an initial point where this UAV is to a final point and the heading is free. So you could arrive at that point from any direction. The shortest way to get there is to turn straight towards it and fly to that point. Um, now, what happens if you add another point into this? And I want to decide what sequence of things I need to do. If the heading is free on the both of those, if I just look at the Euclidean distance from one target to another, and that's that straight line trajectory, um, sure, that's a good uh, guess for what it's going to be, but we're not taking it. It's not a feasible path because we can't fly along those two. Now, it's pretty simple with a case like this, but it gets more complicated and you have to deal with the combinatorial assignment of the order or the permutations and who is doing what while taking into account those, those kinematic constraints. <clears throat> so um, I, wanna, I wanna step back here and, and talk about something that I think people uh, confuse when they're talking about it. I, I think they, they shouldn't say confuse, they use the word lightly. Um, and I want to talk about a, a, a unicycle model. So it's a model with limited heading rate, and it's a good model that works appropriately for fixed wing aircraft. And so a problem that people use in this domain is to determine a minimal length path from an initial configuration, and a configuration is a position and heading to a final configuration and heading. And with those constraints on the heading, the solution to this problem is a Dubin's path. And so people often call them a Dubin's model. I didn't write the model here, but it's actually a unicycle model. And Dubin solves an optimal control problem to come up with these paths. And what's, act what's really interesting about it, it is actually a control problem that, that the solution, as you know, because we have constraints on the control, becomes a bang bang control solution. But people, a lot of times people think about Dubin's and paths as path planning, but it, it is equivalent to a, a control problem. So the path planning and control, and here what I want to point out is they're equivalent. So when we come out with that, we either, in this case, you'd either have a, a controller, a bang bang controller with uh, a value function associated with it, which is the length of the path, or you could think of it as a path. And what's really nice about th this kind of uh, a path, a path planner is that the solutions that you get out to the these unicycle model, no obstacles or anything from an initial configuration to a final configuration is a parameterized path. And that those paths are parameterized either by turns or straight lines. And that's the bang bang of the control. Um, and so it makes it really nice and really easy to plan paths with kinematic models using these Dubin paths where we don't have to solve the optimal control problem anytime. We can work with these parametric um, pieces of circles and straight lines to, to develop the, the solutions to those. Okay, now how can this help us with task assignment? Right, so let's step back to this, uh, this kind of foundational work here in, uh, by Noon and Bean. They, they did something called the Noon Bean Transformation. I'll try to walk through it. It's sometimes, this is called generalized TSP problem. But sometimes people call it one in a bit, one in a set. I like that a little more because I, I can remember what it means rather than just generalized TSP. But the problem is exactly this: it's one in a set. You hear that here there are um, twelve tasks. I only need to visit three of those. So if you notice, there's three sets of tasks. So this set of tasks is grouped together and and so forth. I only want to visit one task in the set, hence the name one in a set. So Noonbeam came up with this transformation to transform the distances to actually solve this one in set problem. So the way, the way you do it, kind of highlighted in, in the yellow here, is I'm gonna, so normally when you solve a, a traveling salesman problem or these routing problems, you would calculate the distances between all the tasks and use that, those distances to calculate the solution. Here we're gonna change them a little bit to solve this one in the set problem. And we change it by, 
created a, a transformed graph. And in this transformed graph, we modify the weights between the different uh, nodes. So for example, inside of a set, we're going we're gonna to add these edges between nodes in a set. And it, these, these, these edges can be just a random tour. You select it however you want, going visiting all the nodes in there. And these, these edges between nodes in a set will be given a, a distance of zero. Then between sets, the purple edges, we're going to add, we're going to say if any edge leaving a set and going into another set, the in, those incoming edges are going to remain the same. But the outgoing edges are going to get, get a cost from the first two of the nodes. So what's, what, I, what, the, what I mean by that is if you, this incoming edge has the, has the weight, which is actually the distance from here to here, then you have zero edge weights, which is a tour. And then once you get to the last uh, eight node in the tour, you're going to put an edge going out to the next set. Um, and that edge right there is actually the distance from this node to that node. And I'll, I'll explain here why you do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that so once you once you set up this transformation, then you can solve that problem. And the solution that comes out it looks something like this. So I start here. I travel to this one. I'm going to travel to these other nodes with no cost. Then I'll travel here, travel again. That so I get this. I get this solution. But in this solution, I'm traveling to all the all the nodes. But what's interesting is the way we change those weights. The actual solution to the problem is to travel between these three nodes in the set, and the and the distance along that path is actually the exact one that's calculated from this solution. So we're able to to solve this generalized TSP one in a set TSP using this this transformation. Okay. Great, that's fine and dandy. How does this help us? I'm gonna give a few, a, a couple problems where this is kind of interesting. So first off is now when we're trying to solve a route or a sequence of uh, a task that an agent needs to go to, we need to, <clears throat> and, and we need to deal with those kinematic constraints. We can use this noon beam transformation to help us do that. So here, what I have are one or five different tasks, and you see they they kind of have quadrants drawn into them. Those those quadrants would represent uh, a sector of headings that you come into or go out of. So what I so for example, let's take this one at the top. I'm going to say I could come in here and go out in the in this sector, or I could come in the top one and go out the bottom one, and so forth. You enumerate all of these. So in order to visit this node, I need to visit one of these um, these quadrants, not all of them, just one of them. And so now I can create uh, I can create a similar uh, problem to that one in the set TSP by deciding uh, by picking which one of these quadrants to go to. Um, and using this, we can actually get bounds on the solutions to the routing problems that help us get tighter solutions, which will help us do better. Um, uh, get more uh, uh, better approximations for our multi-vehicle assignment problems. Um, and I would like to give a shout out to uh, Gupta and uh, Swarup and Siva down at uh, Texas A&M for the work that they've done on this. Um, uh, so, oh yeah. So, what what using this, we can come up with solutions using the one up one in a set TSP and the blue here is the solution to that. And the red is not the, not necessarily the optimal, but it's a, it's a feasible solution that's coming from that, which gives us an upper bound. So that feasible solution is an upper bound and the blue solution using this, uh, this, uh, one in a set TSP gives us a lower bound, which is much tighter. So we know that once we get a solution, we're inside of there and we, we have a tighter, um, Bound. So this gives us in a way to bound solutions to our, our TSP problems. Okay, so now a couple problems that also use this one in set TSP. So this again was uh, was work with Carl Obermeyer was uh, working with us a number of years ago. Um, he was a smart fellow. He's now gone off to work in a startup company that he and his brother started. But what, what this problem is there is we want to um, we want to plan a route for UAVs to visit a number of targets when those targets are subject to occlusion. So you see here, there's a little car and there's buildings around it. So those buildings will block different views, uh, angles from the, from the car. So if I'm up higher, I need to be 
in certain positions. And this green uh, area here represents those areas where the UAV could be and see the target. If it's outside of that, the buildings are blocking it and they can't see it. So now how does this work for one in a set? What you can do is suppose you have a number of targets that have been designated by, by uh, some uh, sensor operator. They say, I want you to go visit these or an Intel analyst. Now we say, okay, I need to visit each of these green locations, one point with inside those locations. So a way to do this is you would sample along the edge of the path and then sample different headings along those. And so now for this set here, I have one, uh, a number of locations along there and a number of different headings, and I need to visit one of those. So now I'm just solving that exact one in a set TSP to decide which one of these to go to, to help me find the, the best route to get there. And so you'll come up with something like this, um, which would visit those, uh, those, those nodes in a way that takes into account the kinematic constraints. So that, that's one way that we can use those, um, uh, that new beam transformation to do this. Another kind of interesting problem here is this uh, GPS, GPS denied navigation problem. And this, um, this was also work done with, um, uh, with Gupta and um, those folks at Texas A&M, but there's also some, uh, some others who have helped with us. Yonkan Cao, who's now at uh, UT San Antonio, uh, was a postdoc with us when he worked on this. And we also collaborated with Dayan uh, Malutnovic out of Santa Cruz. So the first step of this was to develop um, let me step back one second. So the idea here is that we have minimal measurements between different agents. We don't have GPS and we need to get from one point to another. How can we collaborate with others? There's, there's been work done on this with interranging measurements to try to decrease the estimation error of your location accuracy and whatnot. But here what we're trying to do is something different. We're trying to use um, this, this uh, we're trying to use agents and beacons on the ground to help us navigate. So what it was is, assuming you have the software-defined radio that can do ranging between different points, we have a, a, we developed a controller that would orbit orbit a, um, another point. So we were able to measure the range, and from that we could calculate range rate or estimate range rate, and um, develop a controller that orbits those points. And now using just that information and beacons on the ground, we want to go from one point to another. So the kind of the idea here is that air to ground links uh, are usually shorter than air to air links because you have more clutter and things in the way. So what we have is we have two UAVs that are working together to get from one place to another in the environment. So this UAV here would be orbiting around one of these ground sensors. Here it's laid out nice in a nice grid, but it's, it could be more general than that. And the other UAV with an air-to-air -air link actually orbits around that first one. So it's gonna, what it's going to do is pivot from one of these ground sensors to another one. And so we move from this configuration where the two are at these ones to this configuration. And then after it gets here, this next UAV rotates up to the next spot. The next one rotates around the first one so it, so it can get to its target. So if you think about this, um, these, these we, can, we can abstract a, a kind of a... Uh, a routing problem out of this. We can say this is one configuration where agent one's to the west and one's to the east and here's north to south in these positions and we can set up these configurations for each of those nodes. So for each node, so let's say we're, suppose where this one is, there's four different configurations that are possible. The other agent could be here, 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 here. So we have four configurations. And if I want to track, and then I can define a distance between those two configurations. So to go from this configuration here to this configuration here, it's a travel distance of the blue agent traveling up along here. So I can create this graph between these configurations with the distances of, that's governed by these rotations around these. And then once I have that, I have these different configurations and to get from one point to another, it becomes a one in a set TSP problem to solve this. And, um, and that's what's happening over here. You solve the one in the set TSP, and then you have the solution for how to route the agents using these, uh, the, this orbiting algorithm and this uh, navigation uh, problem. Okay, so the next problem I wanna mention here is this uh, ground sensor 
problem. This is a little different. We're not using one in the set, but I wanted to bring this one out because you think about discrete task assignment, discrete tasking, um, and how do I assign multiple agents to go do something useful with static tasks? And so here, here's one that's that's kind of that, that defines this. So what what in the assumptions here is that the UAV is not able to it on its own detect targets on the ground at the time, and I would say even now. Um, Target recognition for uh, fixed wing aircraft in the air is uh, it, it still it still needs work. So here the assumption is there are these ground sensors that exist that can be placed on the ground, different modalities, and they can last for up to a year, a uh, year and a half on battery collecting sensor data. But in order to get that sensor data out, they need to communicate with some other line of sight location that has a generator. Uh, to get that information out over satellite or some other means. So the concept here was these UGS could be laid out on the ground and the UAVs could actually go and pick up the information as a um, as kind of like a mothership gathering information. So that so this that's that's the concept. Um, so in this problem that we developed from that concept was you put the ground sensors on this on a road network. And we're going to monitor uh, intruders that come on that road network to protect and to gather information so we can know where the intruders are and gather pictures of them or capture them before they arrive at sensitive locations. So what the UAV did, would do would be traveling around to the, each of these ground sensors. And, um, and when it gets to a sensor and, it, and that sensor has detected a target that's come by there, the sensor would relay that information to the UAV and then the UAV would now make decisions on where should I go to get a, a picture of this um, this intruder. Um, so kind of the way to think about this, uh, of one chart on the description, and there's a lot of work on this, but um, it's related to cops and robbers games and these other kinds of search on a graph. But here the information structure is a little different in that our information is gathered when we go to an UGS location and that information is delayed. We don't have uh, full information or, or real-time information. So here, what we do is we say, okay, the intruder arrived at this node one, and we look at all the different paths that he could have taken to get to these nodes. And now we want to try to position our UAV and come up with a policy to position our UAV to get a picture of that intruder before the intruder gets out. So if we lay this out and say, okay, along one path, the intruder would get here at this time or this time or this time or these time windows, we can look at along all those paths and see what time the intruder would be at those locations. And so, so that's kind of a forward search, um, forward projection of the uncertainty, I guess, of the, uh, of the intruder. And then from there, we're going to work backwards, like a dynamic program, working backwards to give us a policy to ensure that we can capture that intruder. So and I'll go through a couple steps to kind of see how it works. So the last, the latest time that the intruder could arrive anywhere is here. And so if, if the intruder arrives at that location, the UAV has to be there to get a picture of it or the UAV loses the game. All right, so now we say, okay, if we step back a little bit, go up in time, that time, uh, time is going down, so we're going backwards in time, upwards. We go backwards, the UAV could have been at uh, position two here. And if we don't know where the intruder is going, if, it's, if, it, if it came down here, we don't know if it went this way or this way, we need to check that we can be at position two and get to position three. If that's possible, then a solution is, I get to position two, if the, UAV, if the intruder doesn't show up, I fly to position three and I capture him. However, if we don't, aren't able to, um, we can't fly this distance in that amount of time, or we don't have enough, or we don't have enough agents to do it. We need to back up and say, okay, I need to capture it here because if it goes past here, I don't know where it's going to go, and I I don't have enough information. So I need to be at this point before it can get there. So we step back up the graph using kind of this kind of logic to um, to get the solution. And so. Um, and there, we have a number of papers on this. We, we flight tested it to, as an experiment. And I, I did want to give a shout out to Krishna, who's now out at NASA, um, who, who's uh, kind of fundamental in this work. He worked with us for about eight years and moved out to greater and better things at, at NASA. We're still working with him. 
Um, and then the, we, we collaborated with a number of other people on this. But the la last thing I want to mention this is just for the general everybody is that I think this is a, um, a rich area, not necessarily the Uggs problem itself, which isn't in this, this intruder capture one, but the idea of ground sensors coupled with UAVs is a very uh, interesting problem set area that I think there's a lot of commercial applications that are out there that are not um, not fully developed and that are ripe for uh, the picking. And there's a lot of solutions that you can do. Think about putting ground sensors on a border and these, these sensors that can sit out there, they're not networked and allowing a UAV to go along those just to pick up the information and bring it back. I mean, there's a lot of nice applications there. So. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, another problem I just want, I'll just highlight real quick is persistent ISR. This is again, is like these discrete tasks. Here, we've got no fly zones. We've got green places that we need to go in this graphical depiction. And we want the UAVs to get to those, avoid the no fly zones. Also in this one, we, we were testing also a computer vision algorithm where you can detect uh, vehicles on the ground. Um, and the idea would be an operator specifies uh, priorities for the targets and the UAVs need to route themselves persistently to continuously visit those targets. If something's detected, the UAV could stop, search an area and go back. Um, so I guess uh, there's some work on that. I guess I'll, I'll leave it alone for that, but it's another kind of really good application um, for, for UAVs as target recognition. Because now I'm gonna jump to trajectory planning uh, trajectory and path planning. So I want to say a lot of problems in multi-agent control, if you go even back to the TSP problems I was talking about, they they boil down to getting the UAV to a place at a certain time. Um, so path planning, trajectory planning. We understand how to do minimum time path problems that terminate that that are terminating at a static location. I mean that's that's stuff we can do. The Dubin's vehicles are one if you have fixed altitude. There's numerical techniques you can do to solve that would be quicker, that are, that are fine to use. The, the numerical solutions probably aren't good for cooperative assignment where you have to run thousands of them at a time to decide uh, who's going to do what. But we know how to do that. But um, we need better ways to do trajectory planning, getting agents to a place at a certain time, not the minimal time, but get there at a specific time. I mean, we can solve these numerically, but how can we do it fast enough to make assignments? We want stuff, we want planners that are realizable, uh, kinematically feasible is another way to say it. They can avoid no fly zones, we can compute them on board and satisfy sa safety requirements. They go around, uh, they don't run into each other. So in this area, we are looking at a number of uh, different techniques here. Also using Dubin's paths for uh, intercepting moving targets, um, we're looking at spline-based techniques as well as sampling-based techniques. And kind of the, I'll, this picture here kind of gives one picture of what's going on, then I'll go to the next chart. But the idea here is you've got these red obstacles and you have a target that's moving along this line. And we want to we want to intercept that rendezvous is probably a better term for what we want to say here. We want to rendezvous with that target. So if that target's coming a little earlier, then we need to get there quicker. However, if the target's coming later, then we want to take a longer path to get there. And so using some certain different kinds of techniques, we can um, we can find solutions to those. Um, and we're looking for ways to do this quicker. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'll jump to this one now. So this, um, this problem kind of relates to that simultaneous arrival area um, where we are, we're looking at monitoring a, a, a target persistently. So suppose this is your target and we're gonna define these racetrack patterns here. And when, I, when a UAV is flying down this leg of the, of the racetrack, it has a sensor on the target. And then, but because it doesn't wanna to get too close or for other reasons, it needs to turn off and come back around. Well, we now suppose we either have another vehicle on that rate pattern or another one that's pointed toward it. When this vehicle finishes, we want the next one lined up to keep its sensor on target. You can see this as like, of spacing along the perimeter with consensus algorithms that fits right in there. Um, when you have that uh, border defined, but if we want to use, um, yeah, 
Okay, so the key here is that if we want to control spacing along this path, um, velocity controllers is the way people do it. You generate your path and you adjust your spacing by speeding up and slowing down. The problem is using throttle commands on an aircraft generally is not a good idea to do it, uh, to be ram ramming it back and forth because you're, um, it, it's, they're generally pretty slow to react and, um, and it's not fuel efficient. So what we want to do is we, the, the question becomes, how can we control timing of arrival using space? So how do I adjust my heading for time of arrival? And it's easy, you can think about, if I wanna get there later, I'm gonna do some S turns or something to slow down. But can we find a concise way to do that? So this down here depicts um, using Bezier curves. We did this with uh, Venanzio Cicello, who's at uh, University of Iowa, as well as a student at AFIT. We were all working together on this. So the idea is you've got three agents and we have Bezier curves here. Uh, that we're using Bezier curves to plan a path to get to this uh, this outer ring. So what we have is we have a target, we have a no-fly zone, we don't want to overfly the target, and we have two outer rings. This, if I jump up here, this red thing where you're pointing at the target is essentially the same thing as if I was flying radially inward from the outer line to here. So if I fly from here to here, I have a sensor point of the target. So we want to plan a path for the green agent to get here, then the green agent would fly straight towards the target, and when the green agent gets here, we want the next agent to have planned a path that's lined up at the outside, ready to go in. So you can see green goes, red goes, and then blue goes, and then it starts over again. When blue finishes its task, the red has planned a path and lined up ready to go. So it's this consistent, consistent uh, monitoring of those tasks. Um, another, another way to think about this is if we stick ourselves to, if we, if we restrict ourselves to these specific racetrack patterns, we can adjust the length of it like a trombone to do this. Um, and I might have to get out of this laser pointer here. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to pause this here. So what we have here, we've got four aircraft. Um, this was done by a, a student at AFIT. And we have a, um, a target that's moving along. And what we want here, we don't we don't necessarily want to overfly it on a line, but we just want to intercept it at a at specific spacings, which is pretty equivalent to this. And I can think of the end zone. So it's flying along, and what we're doing is we're adjusting those circles on the first half of the path. So on the first half of the path, where each one is adjusting its circle, that's why the purple one's longer because it needs to get there later. And they're fine tuning them because we've got wind disturbances and uncertainty in the um, in the motion of the intruder. So this is a uh, these are these are adjusting as it's going along. And you'll see that when the blue one gets right to there, it 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 can no longer adjust that length of that path. So now it's going to start using a speed controller to maintain that spacing. And so after it finishes, they they roll their dice and get another random heading. Of which to approach it, and so we can using this we can uh, we can coordinate the timing of these agents to to monitor the target. Okay, so my last section here is on dynamic tasking. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about optimal control and differential games, and the way we think about it in terms of all the task assignments that we talked about in the past. So what we want to do is we want to develop tactics and behaviors using optimal control and differential games. Well, why do we want to do that? If you think back at what I said earlier, the solution to the TSP problem with kinematic constraints, which was that Dubin's uh, path, the solution hinges on an optimal control problem. That optimal control problem is the shortest path problem with constrained inputs, which becomes a bang-bang controller. So what we, what we can say in equivalently with this, if I have dynamic tests, if I can solve an uh, optimal control problem or differential games or stochastic problems, I can get a control policy and the value function. That value function is equivalent to the, the time in a Dubin's path. And so now it's possible that I could use this value function to reason about who should be doing what and make those assignments. But we don't just want to, we don't want to numerically solve optimal control problems on the fly if we're doing it for mission planning. We want to come up with either analytic or really fast heuristics to come up with it to get those, um, 
to get that value function and the policy. So that, that's kind of the idea here. And to do that, we need to balance, uh, appropriately balance um, the fidelity of the model that we're using uh, with computational tractability, like I was talking about there. And oftentimes, the models that we would end up using can be will give us solutions that are not they're not high fidelity, but we can think of them as reference commands to an autopilot. Um, and stoch just stochastic approaches would yield expectation of that value function. So a couple of things here is um, we're looking so we're looking at these analytic and machine and machine learning approaches. So one problem here is this tail chase problem that we've looked at, and this is posed as an optimal control problem where we want to find the minimal expected time to arrive at the tail of this agent while avoiding the front. So I don't want to get in front of him because if he could jam or fire something at me. So I want to get to the tail. Um, so it's this dynamic problem. This, this we worked on with uh, Dayan Malutnevik at Santa Cruz. Another problem here, which I'll talk a little bit later, is autonomous wingman. You have a defender that's defending a target against an attacker. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on this, this chart here is ways of approaching these problems is we can solve, we can try to solve analytic approaches or numerical pro approaches with table, so analytic approaches, numerical approaches with table lookup, or maybe we can partition the state space to get like high level understanding of the solution. And that's what this, these kind of here represent. Up here, we have a turret game where you have intruders that were be coming in at this circle and we have something that can turn and fire at it. And depending on the state of the situation, where the turret is at, so here the turret's facing in a certain direction. If the intruder comes in from a certain aspect, the control that should occur should be a, should be a certain thing depends on the state. And so if we can partition the state space up accordingly, then we can we know the control in each of these policies. So in some position, it might be turned right. In some positions, it might be turned left, or it might be something else. And so if we can position it based on these, we can find the singular surfaces in differential games, characterize them, then we know if we're in a certain subset of the state space partitioned off by these singular surfaces, we know the control policy. The homicidal chauffeur has been resolved recently and, um, using this kind of a, a technique when you partition up the entire state space. Um, the other thing I'm, I, I think that's all I'll say for this right now, but um, so what, with that, so we can come up with these either, how do we come up with these solutions that are useful for assignment? We either coming up with analytic solutions, we're coming up with numerical solutions with a lookup table, or we're partitioning the state space. There's probably other ways, but these are kind of the three approaches we're looking at. Once we get the solution, then we can use, we can use those solutions at, in, a, in like switching policies to decide who should go after what. And here's this kind of depiction assignment. Or if we know um, the cost of the defender being in a certain position relative to the target and the attacker, we can come up with uh, routing problems or, or planning problems to route the defender into positions to be advantageous to protect the high value target using those solutions. Um, so using these analytic solutions, these, these, these solutions that we're not computing numerically on the fly, um, we can use them in an assignment algorithm to build up complex behaviors. Um, and some of these behaviors would be um, like border protection, who should go after it. So here's a target, it wants to get out, it wants to get away. How, how should we optimally plan the headings for these agents to intercept him? and which one should go if we have multiple different intruders. We can look at different ways of assigning, uh, of protecting an a asset with like directed energy or jammers. So in this one, this is a defender and it wants to keep this attacker inside its, uh, inside of a, a ring at all points in time. We can look at capture the flag games and, or we can even look at um, uh, these, these kind of crank and grind scenarios where you're trying to protect an asset here. The blue agents are trying to fire on the target. The red agents are trying to protect it. And so the blue agents would come in until it gets too, too close to the red one. It would fire a missile and then turn and run based on these uh, solutions to these differential games. So we're making assignments of who should do what and when based on the optimal control policy and the value function. And the last thing I want to mention here is that um, 
I, I didn't talk much about artificial intelligence, but I think I feel like I should say a little bit here. So first off, learning approaches and solutions to control problems, it's optimization. However you go about to solve that is artificial intelligence. You can use reinforcement learning, you could, you could use genetic algorithms, whatever. You're solving an optimal control problem. The key is you want to be able to in, uh, say something uh, guaranteed about what you're trying to solve. So what I wanted to point out here is how can control help us with learning? Where's the intersection there? This is me pontificating on this. So first off, we know that optimal control problems with, um, with input constraints are going to give us bang, bang controllers. So the control policy that comes out of it is going to be saturated constraints on the limits of those. So perhaps knowing this, we can come up, rather than trying to come up with learn policies that learn the whole continuous control, we can learn when to switch between the bang bang controllers. And that's what this is uh, representing. This was work done by Zach Fuchs and Pablos down at um, University of Cincinnati. Another one here is if you think at a higher level, I, I, um, I, have, a, an I have a big function I'm trying to learn. There's a bunch of number of inputs going into it. This is task assignment. You have a bunch of agents. It's a function you want to learn. There's correlation be some of the, between those, some of those inputs. I want to understand which ones have inputs that don't that don't correlate to each other, and I can break up that problem um, in a nice way that allows me to learn quicker and faster while not losing the optimality because of that. So. Um, and okay, so summary of what I, that's up, um, the summary of what I want to say. We talked, not in order, but we talked about trajectory of mission planning kind of in the context of coordinated mission planning. We talked about static task assignment with, uh, and routing with physical constraints and the solution to those hinges upon an optimal control problem. And then we kind of stretched from there to say, look, if we want to do dynamic task assignment, maybe we can use what we know from static task assignment and use the solutions of differential gains, optimal control with those value functions as a metric to uh, coordinate with the other agents uh, and decide who's gonna do what. And with that, uh, that's all I have. And if there are any questions. Thanks David for the excellent presentation. It, it was really informative without uh... Uh, equations as well, so it's cool. I like the idea. Uh, well, it's time to take questions. If you have any questions to David, you can simply unmute yourself or type to chat. Or if you're not comfortable, you can email me. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, David, for example, uh, one question. Uh, when you guys deal with uncertainties, are you including them? I mean, how are you dealing like in terms of optimization? Okay, yeah. So there's a couple ways I'd say to deal with that. Um, the first thing is you can pose it as like a stochastic optimal control problem and solve it using those techniques. So that's that's one way uh, to, to deal with that. And that's the work. Uh, I'm not a super expert in that area. We've leaned on other people. They on Malutin if it's been one for those. The other thing I'd say is the way we think about uncertainty is not necessarily in noise parameters, but in the actions of the other agent. I don't know what they're going to do. And that's where the differential gains come in because it's like a worst case policy. You're trying to come up with a control for the worst case. Um, so, and then at, at the other end, you just look at like, we, the other thing I'd say is that like with the, um, that monitoring one where the, the racetrack pattern, then that one, we're looking at string, string stability techniques with input to, input to output string stability with bounded bounded disturbances and bounded output. So those are you know those are the standard ways you deal with these kind of uncertainties. So I see. Thanks a lot, uh, um, David. Also, Tank V is asking for your email address. Could you please share your email address? There you go. Thanks I a lot. can put it in the chat if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. When fault or any crashing on a UAV occurs, what happens on the algorithm for GPS then? So I'm, I, I probably would like to follow up with that. Do you mean by crashing of the algorithm or a UAV crashes or, um, yeah, little 
clarification. Looks like maybe crash, but let's see. <laughs> Okay, so I, I would say this, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in GPS denied navigation. And I'll st if I step back here and say, this is not directly answering it right now, but a lot of people are looking at different techniques for doing GPS denied navigation. There's star trackers that, have, that work, they've done those in the, in the past. Um, people are also looking at collaborative techniques. So if I can measure where another person is, I can use our uh, each of the IMUs and the measurements between them to kind of reduce the the uh, the growth and the uncertainty. And the other kind of technique that people are using are cameras pointed at the ground to see how fast they're moving with the track um, uh, targets or features on the ground. It's kind of guess how fast you're going to help improve GPS. Um, so what what we were looking at is a, we. we we were asked to look at GPS denied navigation and we want to look at something new that was feasible. So we were using this range measurement to do it. Okay, so now if there's a fault or crash, we did not investigate very well what, what would happen in that area. I would say first off, the idea hinge, that we worked on hinges on being able to orbit around beacons on the ground. Um, if any of those go out, uh, you're, you're in trouble. There would be other ways to do that too. You could use triangulation techniques to kind of route your way through. But I, I think I don't. I don't necessarily have a good answer for when it crashes or when it um, how to deal with those those things. So I gave a little answer, but it kind of went around because I don't have a good answer for for what to deal with when it crashes. Also, Krishna posted something to chat about NASA. P -p Please just uh, read it if you are interested. Visit the NASA webpage. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we post the video recording, uh, we are not saving chat. So, <laughs> yeah, so just in case. There is one more question. Yeah, so the time window um, thing, a lot, a lot of, if we talk about static tasks, oh, let me stick to that. And if I go to the, um, the UGS problem that I talked about with the intruder, I'll describe there real quick and then we'll go back. Actually, is my, I should be able to go back to my charts here. If I go back to this, it might help a little bit. Is it, I think it visually see it. Okay, so here's this problem. So if you have time windows, if you think about it, what I had here is the intruder arriving at a specific point at a specific time. If there's variable uh, velocity, so I don't, it, but bounded, I don't know how fast the intruder is traveling. There's going to be a, a window of time here that the intruder could arrive there. So what I need to do is in this case, I need to guarantee that here I can get there at the beginning of the, that time window. And if I'm at the, the other, the other, and if I want to go from point two, I need to ensure I can get to this one at the beginning of the time window. And I need to be able to stay there till the end of the time window, so wait. And then I need to travel to the other one. So when you have time windows, you just need to you need to take into account rather than looking just at one point, you need to you need to just carefully look at traveling from the end of one to the beginning of the next time window and um, waiting there that amount of time in this case. Or instead, that, that's a good way to do it so you can bound. And if you can get inside there and know you can fit in there, you can deal with the time window. So that, that was kind of a real hand wavy thing. But the, essentially the way you do it, would you, you would work with the end to those times, time windows to, to incorporate that in there. But yes, it can be included. So, so I, I mean, one, one comment, maybe young mentioned so um i mean two years ago young and i developed some algorithm on finite time uh business you know we you know we can uh, that algorithm can convert any infinite horizon problem to finite time so um you know if you want if you're interested we can chat more the idea was actually we did for stability type of stuff since we have limited resources stability tools in you know fine, uh, finite time design yeah. when we convert the problem to infinite time we can use 
even classical Lyapunov theory, then we are converting after we make the design, we are converting back to the finite domain. So we are kind of doing time transformation. Yeah, now I'm gonna kind of jump on this because I, I don't, if that was a question for me, that's fine, but I wanna ask Young a question. So Young used to work with Tansel and he's been with me for a year. Now, just real quick, Young, in the problems that you've looked at or the yes. problems that you've seen working here, does anything that with that uh, taking infinite horizon problems to finite time, does, is anything from that fit that you've seen that we've done, like at the scenarios that we've talked about? Um, yeah, I I think like for the problem that uh, you want to solve, usually you use the optimal control for um, uh, solving the problem um but uh what i and then so developed up with, uh, earlier were using the time transformation and it kind of like a feedback controller um so i i think we we need to think a little bit more in order to implement the time transformations method into the problem that we want to solve um so it is a bit different from um what you do um it is so yeah i mean certainly we ne never did something related with optimal control so young for example let's say you have a system transform it to the infinite horizon develop your you know for example you know uh, infinite time algorithm because you're on the infinite time horizon when you switch it back to the actual horizon uh you that will be a finite time problem uh but that will be that will be interesting so yeah we never did that i'm just mentioning about the idea okay It's also a good advertisement for the next semester's first talk. So Young will give a talk in the next semester. Hopefully we will Actually, see. Actually, yes, it's a finite time control, yes. <laughs> uh, one more question from Kingsley. In the example of air vehicle overflying a set of uh, UGS, how did you account for limitations of UGS, such as shorter communication range? Okay, so the the way we dealt with this is that um, so okay, so I'm it when you ask that question, I'm thinking about this problem that's up here right now, which is this UGS problem. Um, but it, you might be talking about the GPS one here. If you look at this video, this is actually interesting. This is actually uh, oh my god, let's switch it over here. Uh, I'm gonna pause this. So if you look at this um, right here at the beginning, in this case, these are actual ground sensors. There's there's more, this is, this is a closed -in area. These are ground sensors that are on the ground in a real flight test, okay? And I'll, I'll slide through this, but if you look, the green vehicle is actually closest to this, but because of the bank angle or the, where the antenna is situated on it, it can't talk to that ground sensor, uh, but the purple one actually can. So, um, so that issue of air-to-ground communication was really an issue. And here we were using Wi-Fi for, wi for this. So if I slide along, you can see not, none of the UGS are in contact with them. And here, the green one comes in contact, detects, and is able to detect the intruder. And the purple one only talks to it like right there when it's over it. So the way we accounted for it in this case is that the agent had to when we were routing the vehicles, we had to directly fly over the UGS. Um, and, and, and I can't say that's perfect, but in all the cases we had, when we were overflying it, we, we, we would connect. And so um, if it connected earlier, we could gather the information without getting there directly and then make our decision earlier. But otherwise, we'd, we'd plan to go over it. But once we got the information, we'd replan in this case. Um, I think I'll leave it. I think I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So a couple things on this. I, I I don't think we we have a good. I don't think I have a perfect answer for this, but I have some answers for it. <laughs> the easy one is you replan. Um, so we've looked at kind of event triggered techniques where you either have an information filter where you're predicting where your neighbors are and when they're gonna get where they're supposed to be, your teammates. And then if you see that you're blown off course or something and you're not gonna make your time, and it, that affects what, what they're doing, you would trigger an event 
and re and replan as needed. So that's that's one way to deal with it. Um, the 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 other thing I'd say is that like with Dubin's path, this is kind of with the Dubin's path planners. Um, it's kind of interesting if you're planning this path. It's really hinges on what happens on the end. Um, if you actually plan your path for a larger turn radius than the vehicle can can travel, then you have some extra play at the end to get there for uncertainty to get there at a certain heading. That's another answer. The third answer, which I'll, I'll um, that we're working with uh, Dayan Malutnivik at Santa Cruz. So if you go back to those stochastic optimal control problems and coupling them together, uh, one one solution in this this kind of realm, which is actually very interesting, is you create a set of controllers to uh, arrive at some point. Okay, and that point could be moving. And then what happens is each of those controllers could be parameterized by something. So let's say the velocity. So each each is a uh, optimal controller to intercept this point that's moving, uh, but at different velocities. So kind of mode switching. And when you get when you get there, you you can uh, you come up with some means to switch between those controllers. So if you think about it, the 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 concept for the problem that they're looking that they was looking at is you have a gate you're trying to get to that's rotating. So I want to fly through the gate. I can't fly it through it this way. So if it starts twisting, I'm not going to be, I might, I might get to a point where I can't turn to get in there if I'm going a certain speed. So what happens is you can learn or develop a way to switch between to the slow controller that allows you to turn slower to get in there. So there's another way to deal with some certain uh, modifying your controller for, for different speeds accordingly to get there. So. Okay, hey, I, I think we don't have more questions. Well, thanks, David, again for just spending your time with us on this Friday. It was a pleasure to watch your presentation. Well, thank everyone for attending. Take yeah, care. thanks, David. Thanks, Marwe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye.